How's it going everyone? Today we're going to talk about compounds with polyatomic ions. How to write names and write formulas for these compounds. Say I give you the, the formula of a compound. We need to be able to write the name of that compound, figure out what cations and anions are involved, draw a picture of it, and then look at um, how many atoms are in there and how many ions are possibly in there. So let's take a look at FeSO4. We have to be able to break that into its cation and its anion, its positive ion and its negative ion. So if I split it, I'm going to get my positive ion and my negative ion. And the positive ion that you see is an iron atom or an iron ion. And the anion is an SO4. Now, the first thing we have to do is figure out what are the charges. So the charges involved here are going to be easy if we start with the negative side first. If you look up on your, um, your sheet, we can actually see that there is a sulfate ion, which is an SO4, and it takes a minus 2 charge. So if it takes a minus 2 charge, and we know that all compounds have a total charge of 0, then the iron is going to have to take a plus 2 charge. So it's going to be an Fe plus 2 charge, and the name of this compound is going to have to be iron to sulfate. So just reading right off the sheet. So we've got iron to and sulfate, and we easily get the name. Now, we need to kind of draw a particle diagram of what's going on. So first off, let's draw an iron. So an Fe, um, and then we'll switch colors, and we need an SO4. So what that really is, is we've got an S and with four O's attached to it. Okay, so there is my FeSO4. Now if I count up the number of atoms in here, I'm going to have one, two, three, four, five, and six atoms in my... Um, compound, so we'll say that there are six atoms in there, one Fe, one S, four O's for a total of six. Now when you drop FeSO4 into water, it's going to break back into its original ions. But there are really only two ions in this case. There's an iron ion, an iron two ion, and there's an SO4 or, or a sulfate ion. So where it's going to break will be right here and it's going to form two ions. Okay, now let's take a look at different way to solve these problems. Say that the question gives you the ions that are involved first of all and then asks you to turn this thing around and find a name of a compound that would be formed and the formula that would come out of that. So the easiest way to do this is to start with a name um, and Ca plus is going to be a calcium ion so we can write always beginning with the uh, the cation or the metal, we've got calcium, and then we have to look for our C2H3O2 ion, which when we look down here is going to be an acetate ion. So it'll be calcium acetate. Now the formula of this compound. When we look, we can see that we have a plus two charge and we have a minus one charge. That does not equal zero. So in order to get this thing to balance out, I'm going to need two of the acetate ions. I'm going to need two of my negative one ions to balance out my positive two ion. So the way I'm going to write that is to say calcium, and then I'm going to need parentheses, a C2, an H3, an O2, and I'm going to need two of them. Okay, so two of the acetates with a negative one charge balancing out one of the calciums with a positive two per charge. Now the particle diagram for this is a little more complicated. So we'll have calcium in the middle here, and then I'm going to need two C's, three H's, and two O's. So two C's, um, switch colors, three H's, so we'll go one, two, three, and two O's over there and the same deal on the other side so we'll need two C's uh, three H's one two three and two O's over here so we'll kinda get something like that now does it matter where you draw the circles no uh, what I'm mostly concerned with is do you know which circles belong together in groups 
and which circles kind of hang out on their own. So in this case, as long as you had two of the blue circles, three of the green circles, and two black ones together as a group, as an acetate ion, then that's really what we're after here. Okay, so I could actually just take and wall off this and call that an acetate. And we could wall off this ion and call that an acetate, and you've got a calcium in the middle. So right away, you can see that I actually have three ions here in this compound. Two acetate ions and one calcium ion. And the number of atoms in here is, you, can be found simply by uh, adding up all of the circles. So 15 atoms in the compound. Basically, there's one calcium. There's going to be four carbons, six hydrogens, and four oxygens. When you total that up, should be 15 atoms total in the compound. We just wrote out a formula for calcium acetate that involved a parentheses. So why do we need them? Before we talk about that, let's back up to math class and look at something that's a little more familiar. So let's say I give you a formula, y times y times y. You would are used to shortening that to just be y cubed. So would you ever write y cubed with the parentheses around the y? And the answer is no, it would be a waste of time. You only have one element inside those parentheses, and so why do you need to parentheses them off? Why do you need to like group them in because it's only one thing? So now let's look at a different formula. What if I gave you x plus y plus times x plus y times x plus y? And you would say, well, isn't that just x plus y cubed? It's true. Can you write x plus y cubed instead? And the answer is no, that's totally different meaning. If you write x plus y cubed, you're saying all I want to do is cube the y. If you write x plus y, then you're cubing the entire quantity. Now, when we go to chemistry class, before we wrote out calcium acetate as C2H3O2 with parentheses. Okay. Can we just leave them off? Well, we can't because if we did that, we would wind up with CaC2H3O22. But we don't want to tell people that there are 22 oxygen atoms in a calcium acetate. So the next thing students always ask is, well, with this 2 here, can't I just double all my subscripts and come up with CaC4H6O4? And the answer is no there also, because it destroys a structural cue. So imagine two people are hiding in a closet, and you quick peek in. And you then describe to your mom, you say, Mom, I just looked in my closet, and there was this thing with four arms and four legs and two heads. Well, she's going to think you're describing a space alien or a monster. If you instead say, look, Mom, I saw two of these things, and they each had two arms, two legs, and one head, your mom would say, yeah, they're you know, your brother and sister are hiding in your closet. So by putting the parentheses around them, you actually say, look, I want these things to be groups. Not so that it's one unmanageable, huge mess, but that it's actually just two groups of two C's, three H's, and o two O's. So let's sum this up. When do you use parentheses? So the first couple videos, we never used them because the compounds we were talking about contained no polyatomic ions. So here we're going to take a little flow chart. We're going to say first step, does the compound have any polyatomic ions? If the answer is no, then you do not need any parentheses. If you do have a pro, uh, polyatomic ion involved in your compound, then we need to ask a further question. When you write the compound out, do you need more than one polyatomic ion? If you need two or, poly, two or three polyatomic ions, you might have a need for parentheses. So if you have more than one or two polyatomic ions, then you, need to, you have to ask yourself, do I need to double or triple these polyatomic ions? Okay. So if you have a single polyatomic cation or anion, then the answer is no, um, you do not need any parentheses. Is it recording right now? Yes, it is. Oh, hello, oh, Sturman. Bye.